Okay, let's get started. Um, for those of you out in uh, TV land, it is sparse here today because of Sundar's keynote, but uh, we will uh, plow ahead fearlessly anyway. Um, thank you for those of you who did come. So just a reminder on the schedule, um, we had two lectures this week uh, on theory and now practice of lighting. Next week, there's only one lecture, which is Monday, on photographic image processing. Um, and uh, that's going to be a squeeze. That's a long and complicated lecture, and so it may spill over a little bit until the last lecture, which is the following Monday. Again, because we couldn't get the room for Wednesday. Uh, so there'll be a Monday and then the following Wednesday, and that will finish the course. Okay, just so you know the schedule. Uh, and uh, of course, for those doing the assignments, there. Uh, oh, this has not been refreshed. There, this assignment, the portraiture assignment, is now online, and that's due this Sunday. If you're doing the assignments. And speaking of which, uh, I had a chance to look at the best, uh, to look at the submissions for the landscape assignment, and there were some great ones. So let me show you some of my selection of the best photographs. Uh, here's Lauren Nori um, on the requirement of an S curve. That's a beautifully composed photograph with a very nice S curve in it. And I, I'm guessing this is London, is that right? It looked like London to you guys. I think Lauren is in, in the London office. Um, she also has a very nice uh, golden hour picture. And you can tell she's a go get him Googler because it's a sunrise picture. It's not a sunset picture. And the, the contrails make a very nice uh, adjunct. So Alice Liu on natural text, the natural textures requirement. Very nice, filling the frame with textures. And she actually had two that were very nice textures. Um, I happen to know Alice was recently in New Zealand, and this is a glacial crevasse in New Zealand. Uh, to remind you of one of the George O'Keefe paintings that I showed when we were talking about composition. And finally, uh, panoramas. We have uh, Florian's panorama. I assume this is in Marin County somewhere? Yeah. Uh huh. So of course, it's hard to show a panorama. Uh, We'll talk about compositional rules for panoramas in the last lecture. So let me at least zoom in a little bit so you can see how beautiful the, the details of the panorama are. And then the last requirement was improve on nature. And here's Florian's take on that. Uh, so here's the original picture. And here it is after digital dodging and burning, essentially. So we'll talk about that in the last lecture when we talk about methods of doing high dynamic range tone mapping. Okay? All right. So today's topic is uh, photographic lighting. So it's the practical side. Uh, last time we talked about the units, um, luminous intensity, luminance, illuminance, and so on. Let's put some of that to work this time, and we'll talk about photographic lighting. So in particular, I'll give a taxonomy of light sources, and it's a rather peculiar mathematical taxonomy, but I think you'll find it uh, uh, il interesting. And then we'll talk about lighting in particular for portraiture. We could talk about other genres, but the assignment this week is portraiture, so it seems like a logical thing to do. Uh, we'll talk about studio lighting, and then we'll uh, talk about special lighting problems uh, that you could attack either in the studio or with other lights, and then we'll talk about flash. So we'll go through kind of from natural to more and more artificial lighting. All right, so here's that taxonomy. So this is a, uh, a paper that appeared in CVPR a number of years ago, and they made an interesting um, abstraction for the kinds of lighting that you will find in photography. They said a light source could be a point, or could be a line, or could be an area. So let's think of its parameterization in um, X and Y that could either be zero or infinity in either X and Y. So zero, zero would be a point. Infinity, infinity would be a continuous area source. And then the question is, at every point on that source, does the light go in only one direction or does it go in many directions? And you could even separately uh, say, how about it's spread that way, right? Or how about it's spread that way. We could call this uh, HP and HQ. Do you see what I'm drawing here? And um, 
that would tell you whether it is just a single line or spreads in a fan or spreads as an area source. And so with those four variables, you can see them here. So let's look at a couple of them. So in particular, um, here's a spotlight or laser. So it's zero, 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 zero. It's a point in area and a point uh, and a single direction. Okay, that's one's easy. Let's look at another one. Uh, here is a fluorescent tube. So this is the old style fluorescent tubes. Uh, it's a long tube, so it's infinite in one direction, zero in another to first abstraction. But the glass of the tube itself is a diffuser. So at every point on the tube, it sprays light in all directions. And so you see um, infinity zero, and then infinity infinity for the two directional components. All right, let's do one more that's a little bit more esoteric. Sunlight coming through a crack in the door. Okay, so... The crack in the door is a linear source, so that's going to be infinity zero again. But the sun is infinitely far away, so its light is largely parallel. So if you only have a crack open in the door, the light will only go in one direction. So that's zero, zero in directionality. And that will light something in a particular way. So as you think about photographic lighting, it's just interesting to think about whether your light is point, line, area, directional, directional in, in two dimensions. I found that taxonomy interesting. So let's apply it right now. How are these two shots lit? Want to take a stab at it? What do you think is the lighting for, the, for these two shots? One on the left is a specular. One on the left is, what do you mean specular? Uh, Okay, you say, oh, a point source at infinity. Yeah, so the zero, zero, the... Uh, okay, so uh, the sun would be, uh-huh. Uh or any single light. And the one on the right? Uh, diffuse. Diffuse. And what are you basing that on? The directionality and strength of the shadows. Shadows, right. So this is, I'm going to have a lot of quizzes like this today. I want you guys to get good at judging what the, uh, how a scene is lit. It's something that a, a photographer finds to be a useful skill. And so indeed, look at the sharpness of the shadows here. And look at the fact that um, the caustic coming off of the glass is largely parallel, maybe not entirely parallel, so it's probably the sun, uh, whereas all the shadows here are diffuse. So observations of the strength, uh, the sharpness of shadows go, of course, all the way back. Here's a nice Leonardo drawing on umbra and penumbra where he has an aperture up here and light's coming through that aperture and he says this part behind the occluding uh, sphere will be entirely dark, so that's umbra. This part will be entirely lit, in other words you can draw uh, rays from a point out here to every point on the aperture, so it's not in shadow. And these parts here are in penumbra, they're in part shadow because some of the rays will be blocked by the sphere. And so he analyzed these and talked in essays about how painters should take advantage of them when drawing different kinds of light sources. So this is recognized by him. Okay, so let's talk about one genre of lighting, which is lighting for portraiture, which again is your assignment if you're doing the assignments. And we'll kind of go through a number of different possibilities, uh, conventional studio lighting, some unconventional lighting, available light, which means whatever is there in the scene, and a narrative light which t plays a role, uh, becomes a player in the story. Uh, okay, so the first one is a picture I've shown you already. So we talked about the composition uh, of this ch famous Churchill portrait. We talked about the triangle made by the, the head and the hand and the hand. Let's look now at the lighting. So the lighting is, this is Joseph Karsh, by the way, who we've already seen several pictures from. Um, it's light accents on a dark is the general way to think about it. The overall feeling of the scene is dark. He's wearing a dark suit and he's using light to bring out the elements that are important. Now, I su suspect he's done some dodging and burning here that it isn't quite as contrasty as this. Um, notice something else he's done. Look at the background. It's not entirely dark. He's got a light shining on the wall a little bit in order to soften that a bit. So, uh, light accents on a dark background. Compare that to this picture. So another Josef Karsh, uh, Audrey Hepburn. It's dark accents on a light. 
He's deliberately said, look at the color of her skin, look at her beauty, let's make it a white background and have her skin just a little bit darker than that and then use dark accents everywhere. Um, it's a very famous photograph. It even was the model for a Google Doodle on her uh, 85th birthday. Last, that was two years ago, I guess. Uh, clearly taken from this portrait. The composition of the portrait is also really interesting. So we talked about balance of diagonals when we talked about composition. So look at the strong diagonal of her back. And then just like that um, Titian portrait that I showed, there are off diagonals that balance it. And so the off diagonals are arm, the slope of her nose, maybe her eyelashes, balancing that one very strong diagonal through here. It's a very careful composition. This is not accidental. Uh, okay, so this is more unconventional uh, lighting. Look at the eyeball. It's very carefully lit. He's got a light coming from the side. It's not only this lamp that's lighting up uh, Peter Lorre's face. So you know who this is, Peter Lorre? Um, Rick, you've got to hide me, hide me. Ugarte from Casablanca. Uh, it's also got the asymmetrical use of the eyes, so the one bright. Uh, eye and the one subdominant eye, just like the Churchill portrait did. So here's another unconventional, very strong lighting uh, in Joseph Karsh's portrait of Picasso. And he's definitely got the two eyes having different treatments. As a matter of fact, it's almost like this is um, dark. Uh, this is what shows here is the whites of his eyes against dark and the darks of his eyes against white. And uh, it's almost like the shadows and the brightnesses are reversed on the two sides of the face. Is he playing some kind of cubist game with Picasso's face? That's a, my own conjecture uh, because of who the subject is. Nicely lit portrait. Uh, here's another one. So when we talk about key and fill light in a moment, this is an unusual lighting because the key light is just illuminating almost the rim of his face. And there's very little fill light. There are probably is a fill light. You can see it here on his temple, but it's very, very weak. And so the largest part of his face has almost no lighting, which is an unconventional lighting, uh, studio lighting, but gives him some, some drama to Humphrey Bogart. This is a more conventional lighting, uh, maybe even a harsh lighting, where the main light or the key light is right smack on his face. But it's been kind of softened by the furrowed, by the, the wry expression on his face. Uh, and the, the tilt of his face and the softness of the, the fabric. So Yosef Karsh thought he could get away with a harsh lighting because of just how strong the facial expressions uh, were. All right, so uh, that's, a, yeah, so that's all I'm going to show for studio lighting for Yosef Karsh, except that I can't help, since I've got these two portraits, that there's this famous joke about these two guys. They were contemporaries, actually, and um, let's see, how did it go? George Bernard Shaw sent uh, a letter to Winston Churchill um, saying, I'm enclosing two tickets to the first night of my new play. Bring a friend if you have one. Winston Churchill wrote back and said, Oh, terribly sorry. Can't attend the first night. We'll attend the second night if there is one. I wouldn't pick a fight with either, a verbal fight with either one of these guys. All right, so let's talk about available light. So it's challenging, it's worthwhile, uh, requires patience and luck, and it's an argument for always carrying your camera, which is, by the way, it's a funny argument these days. When I first started teaching this course, the cell phone cameras weren't as good as they are now, so everyone does always carry a camera of some kind. So, um, Last Yosef Karsh portrait I'll show, this is uh, George O'Keefe, the painter who we've already considered uh, as an older woman, and it's a completely available light portrait. There's light coming in through the door. She's sitting there. Some of the pictures we saw of her were of her hands. She is always particular about posing with her hands in some dominant position, in this case showing the texture of them. There is probably a fill light, but the fill light is probably just a card. In other words, if you look at her hand, there's some light that seems to be coming from here, not from the open doorway that's on the right. I suspect you just had a white card here because the sunlight was so bright. Maybe there was a wall here that's reflecting a little bit of light back to fill her face and to fill her hand. 
Okay, so let's uh, switch to another artist. This is Available Light, Richard Avedon. Um, he was a famous fashion photographer, and then he did portraits of famous people, and then eventually he began this series of just everyday Americans. And he called the book In the American West, which is sort of like Margaret Bourke White's book that we, um, you have seen their faces, that we talked about when we considered the Dust Bowl. So what he did was he, he would set up uh, a little studio outdoors with just a white screen. And it was completely available light. Here's his setup and he would place people in front of that white screen and just take a picture of them. No context, no scenery, no background. Avedon is deliberately asking you to try to read the character and the lives of these people just from their faces, from their skin, from their clothing which is probably not that hard in the case of this young rural girl. Another thing about these portraits is that they were done with a large format camera. He would print them life size, meaning the size of a human, she would be the size of, uh, of a girl, and then hung at eye level in a gallery. So they're very large portraits. And there's something viscerally powerful about a portrait that's life size and eye level even if it's not stereo and virtual reality and whatever else Sundar is talking about in the keynote, uh, it's a very powerful effect. And so it's um, quite an interesting experience to go look at a retrospective of Avedon's portraiture. He even left in the frame of his view camera negatives to kind of give you this feeling that this is almost like a mug shot, just a narrative, hard biting narrative of the lives of these uh, people. So he was, as I said, a fashion photographer, so here's a fashion shoot, just to kind of round out the picture of Richard Avedon for Christian Dior. It's amazing that something like that is, um, they're not all hung up by strings, but I think they're actually moving here. And I think it's her coat that's being advertised in this case. Um, so available light doesn't necessarily need to be plain or diffuse. It can actually even be a pictorial element in the scene. So we talked about the pictorial uses of color. So here's a pictorial use of light, where the light is actually a geometric element that becomes part of the composition. Uh, it can, light can, available light can even be a narrative light. It can actually be a dramatic player in the scene. So here's a painting that does that, uh, Caravaggio's uh, Calling of St. Matthew. So this is Jesus over here, and the St. Matthew is the tax collector, and he's saying, you, follow me. And St. Matthew is sort of saying, who, me? And the light coming from behind is sort of like God saying, yeah, you. Question? I had a question on the previous photo. On the previous photo, um, this one. Oh, uh-huh. Um, yes, you have to consider the perspective in the scene, though. In other words, the, if I look directly at the sun, the rays from the sun are parallel, but it's very far away, and those rays will appear to me as if they're radial coming out from the sun. So that's just part of the natural perspective. Sorry? Even the rays that seem to be going... Yeah. I mean, just, just think of looking directly at the sun. Those rays seem to radiate, sure. even though they're parallel, because where you're standing. It's just a, an artifact of perspective. Florian? In the other, there may be a thought that part of your optical illusion, some of the rays are coming uh, right at you, and you're interpreting as them as going left to right and diverging when they're really coming at you and they're parallel. Right. I, I think that's sort of another way to say, to say what I did. We have a Dory comment or question. Uh, I notice that the example portraits are mostly monochrome. It would be nice to show some excellent color portraits for us to learn. I don't have any ready, but that's a very good point. And I will ameliorate my lectures. Uh, I'm trying to think if I have any color pictures later. I have color pictures when we talk about specific lighting, but not famous portraits. That's a valid criticism. Um, so, color portraits. I will, I will work on that.
Thanks. Uh, okay. All right, so narrative use of light. Uh, the light is a dramatic player. Here's a photograph that does, in my opinion, sort of the same thing. It's one of Maple's Thorpes, Maple Thorpes. Um, and the light is clearly, the diagonal slash of light and shadow is clearly a strong compositional element, but it's also a narrative element. It's almost like singling out, I mean, why is, why am I being singled out from this light from above? It, it almost wouldn't have the same meaning if it, light were coming from another direction. Think, do that as a thought experiment. And so it is sort of a narrative player in the scene. Okay, so let's switch gears and talk about ways of doing lighting. And we'll start with studio lighting. So there's a menagerie of things here. Um, let's see, what are they? This is a bunch of fluorescent bulbs. Uh, if you cover it with a white sheet, you get um, a diffuser or what's called a soft box sometimes. I'll show you a few examples of that. Uh, let's see, up here we've got uh, a spotlight with a reflective umbrella. So the spotlight is pointing into the umbrella. Uh, I'll show you that uh, flashing uh, shortly. Uh, here's a spotlight. There's a floodlight, which is just broader. It's got a white internal uh, can so that it's diffusing a little bit. There's a strobe that flashes briefly. So a lot of these have a lot of different adjustments. So a simple spotlight may, for example, have a zoom so that you can change the goniometric diagram on it. So remember we talked about goniometric diagrams for reflectance last time? This is a goniometric diagram for luminous intensity. So luminous intensity, remember that's lumens per steradian, so lumens per solid angle, and you can uh, characterize that at different directions, and this is just a, a cut, a cross section through it. And so this is showing that it's mostly straight ahead, there's the origin at the top, and a little bit of light to the side, so think of the length of the vectors uh, in each direction as being the amount of light, and to the, uh, to the left and right side, there's no light. And so whenever you look at a spotlight in a catalog, it'll have a goniometric diagram like this, typically. And you can change that on some of these spotlights. So here's a typical professional spotlight, and it's got a zoom. Can you see the optics moving back and forth? So that lens in there will actually change the spread. It'll change the goniometric diagram. You can also clip the goniometric diagram with these so-called barn doors. That's what these are. And then there's a filter holder that will fit in here as well if you want to change the color of it. And then you can change the intensity um, with a power supply. So there are actually a lot of degrees of freedom on these professional spotlights. Barn doors, filter holders, all right. Yeah, there it is, zoomed. Uh, these lighting rigs can be pretty large. You can scale up at, uh, what I just showed. So here's a motorcycle being lit for some uh, commercial use, and those are very, very large soft boxes. So that soft box is about six feet. Uh, this is kind of an old photograph. Is using using Polaroid preview pictures uh, instead of digital phot photography. Yeah, yeah, hair, uh, 1970s haircut there. Um, all right. So how do you use studio lighting to light um, a person? So the basic idea, there are four kinds of lights in, uh, at 35,000 foot level. One is the main or key light, which you could just define as being the brightest light. And so here it is here, and there it is when it's on. The fill light is a lower intensity light that's intended to make the shadows not too dark. And so here it is here, and here is only that light on. There might be a rim or accent light from the side, um, which would put a rim on the edge of the face, or in this case, <coughs> excuse me, lighter hair. And then there may be a light on the background. See that light is shining backwards toward the backdrop. And now the question is, how do you combine those lights? You can move them around and place them, and you can also adjust their intensities. And so this has all four kinds of lights in order to make a typical professional portrait. And the arrangement of them relative to the camera's view is one important variable. So here are alternative lighting arrangements, and they all have names um, in this profession. So broad lighting means that the key light is illuminating the side of her face that is uh, most facing the camera. 
So a typical portrait view is what's called a three-quarter view. You're slightly turned to the side, and so she's, she's turned to the right, and the key light is here. Uh, this has the characteristic, maybe because it's illuminating this kind of horizontal area, to be able to broaden narrow faces, and a professional photographer will know that. So short lighting uh, is the most common, and that's where the key light is on the side of the face that doesn't have quite as much il illumination. And then the fill light would be on this side. And then if the person's looking straight ahead and you have symmetrical illumination, what's called butterfly illumination, that's a, called a glamour shot. So those are some variables that you can play with on a, on a portrait. Um, broad lighting, where the lighting, let's see, the broad lighting was this one, where it's on the major side of the face. Broad lighting is sometimes called Rembrandt lighting. So why is it called Rembrandt lighting? Because what it leaves on the side of the face away from the camera, she hasn't turned very much, but she's turned a little bit, is a little triangle of light. And you go to Rembrandt portraits, a lot of them have exactly that arrangement. Face turned slightly to the side, one eye dominant, the other eye not, and a little triangle of light. It's a standard portraiture technique that goes back into the history of painting. And so studio portraitists, photographers know this, and they call it Rembrandt lighting because they know about Rembrandt. Um, so the ratios of the key and the fill light is one of the main variables you can play with. And so you can decide whether you want uh, a high ratio, which is, I don't know, um, James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause, or do you want very soft ratio, almost one-to-one, -one, which is more like Tom Hanks in Forrest Gump? It's a completely different mood for the, for the scene. So think about the mood you want to convey when you set up lighting and you adjust the ratios of the key and fill light. The color of the key and fill light is also a variable you can play with. And so uh, here's a painting that does that. Um, this is Maxfield Parrish. We looked at his paintings before. And just a reminder that it, this is not an oversaturated uh, digitization of one of his paintings. This is the way he painted. He used these strongly saturated enamels. So what's the intended key light and what's the intended fill light in this painting? What's Maxfield Parrish's intent intention? Where's the key and where's the fill and what do they represent? It's a natural scene. They're not spotlights set up in the studio. The sun. The sun. And then the other side of it is a cooler light, which is basically the fill from the shadows and from the reflection uh, from the sky. At the sky, right. Mm -hmm. So that's a very typical combination. So it's m slightly more golden light for coming from the sun, and then the fill light is the blue sky, which is a cooler color. And this perhaps evolutionarily is something that humans like. And so uh, did the lighting artists on Pixar, at Pixar. And so if you look at Toy Story, look at, look at Buzz. He's got this warm key light and a cooler fill light. I happen to know this is true because I know who did the lighting for uh, Toy Story. But, and, and he liked Maxfield Parrish. All right, so the arrangement of lights for a face is, is what I've just talked about. The arrangement of lights for larger figures and more complicated um, scenes is an art. And to help you along with that art, you can go out and buy photograph professional photographic lighting manuals that will have pictures like this in them. And uh, there'll be a portrait like that. And then there'll be a diagram like this next to it. And every page is like that. It's got a portrait. And then it's got a diagram next to it. And so this is an overhead view. There's the strongman, and it's a diffused spotlight, so it might be a soft box, like I showed you before. And then this might be just a card, a white card. And so here's the key light. Here's the fill light. You can see the key light is on this side. The fill light's on this side. Fairly soft ratio between them. So once you get used to this idea, you should be able to just whip that off the top of your head, where the lights are and what the ratios are and so on. So just so you don't think I'm only showing he men, here's a she woman. And here is the lighting for that arrangement. She's coming out of a pool. Here's her. 
This is a dark field lighting. So this is very, very hard to do. It's black in the background, but she's got rim lighting. And so there had to be lights sort of in the back and on the side. And then what this says is a black foam core card to flag, to, to block basically the background and make it, uh, to block the lights from the camera. So it, they only illuminate the subject. So you don't see those lights. So you see dark. Um, here's the setup for it in a pool. Uh, that's not the, the woman, that's uh, the photographer. And he says it took all day to set up this one photograph. Just arranging the flags and the soft boxes and the lights and the umbrella back here to get that one shot. Architecture is a special problem. So this looks like just a nice inviting winter lodge shot, but it's actually a very difficult shot. Um, there's the lighting situation for it, but the other thing to note is that you can see the skiing mountain outside. So it's kind of a dusk probably. It's a two second exposure in order to be able to bring up the outdoors. And if it's a two second exposure, that's a very long exposure. It probably means that this lighting is very dim. So he had to deliberately turn down the interior lights so that he could use a two second exposure in order to bring in the outside. And of course that had the disadvantage that it blew out the fire. So there's a lot of things that he's balancing here as well as a, uh, a light in the back in that room. You can see that indicated here. Um, one more example, I think just one more. How is this lit? Shiny objects are definitely a special problem. How do you think this was lit? Florian? A white tent. Right. So it's a, essentially that. It's a box. And you can see the reflection of that here. Uh, has to make sure that the room that the camera sits in is entirely dark, so you don't see the camera through that little narrow slit here in the bell of the trumpet. Um, wants to try and make it sort of a soft, satiny feeling, and did that with uh, diffuse reflectors. So basically a tent. Uh, another special problem is food. And why is this a special problem? Because of the 1962 Law on Truth in Advertising of the Federal Trade Commission that says that you cannot apply anything to food in advertising photography except the natural juices from the can. So no glosses or varnishes are allowed. And he'll actually describe it here. He says, so this is actually, um, he's setting up for a shot for Lucky Stores, but he wants to include it in his portfolio. So he'll use his own labels there that don't, that don't represent any real brands. And he'll say, to achieve a high shine on the can lips, each can was polished, new labels were attached, the contents of each can were arranged with a pair of chopsticks. Liquid from the individual cans was applied to each item with a small brush to prevent dryness. So this <laughs> took a long time to set up as well. And if you look at these professional lighting manuals, you'll just see these very straightforward descriptions of exactly how to, to do this. In fact, I think there are, there are books on photographing food. Uh, seems like everyone takes pictures with cell phones these days of food. I don't know if they sit there and arrange the items with chopsticks. Maybe they do. One fun fact uh, for photographing cereal, you can actually use Elmer's glue instead of milk if you want. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> Without, Without violating the law? Not the milk. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> we'll check with the lawyers on that one later. <laughs> uh, all right. Here's another special problem. Uh, uh, very shallow textures. So an overhead light on this historical doily does nothing. What you need is a grazing light. And so grazing light is very common for embossed surfaces, uh, surfaces with a slight bit of relief. Uh, so here's a little side light. It's a project that I worked on for visualizing cuneiform tablets. The problem with cuneiform tablets is that, first of all, the writing goes around the edges. And second of all, there's no one lighting direction that can really help you visualize and therefore read the uh, indentations. And so what we did was uh, uh, we took a cuneiform tablet, that's a real ancient tablet, scanned it with laser scanners. I already showed you how laser triangulation scanning works. 
unwrapped it. So we actually did a, a spline transformation in order to unwrap it, to create a single surface where depth <coughs> is uh, denoted by darkness. And then we did a non-photorealistic rendering of it. And the particular shading here is called accessibility shading. And the definition of it is if you were to roll a ball across the surface and let that ball go into the indentations and make the ball small enough to reach the bottom of each indentation and then make the intensity that you render proportional to the radius of the ball you used, dark being the smallest ball, you'll get this appearance. It's called accessibility shading because you're essentially rendering it, you're visualizing how accessible each point on the surface is. And so um, it's, it's easy now to see what it, what it says. And that's the purpose of the project. I probably say, oh, I don't know. What does it say? It says um, two heads of broccoli at 97 cents a piece. Or I, don't know. I don't know what it says. <laughs> they were often commercial contracts like that. It's not an entirely a spurious conjecture. How is this sculpture lit? So this is actually a trick question. Here it is close up. Probably guessed it's not a sculpture, actually. It's a bas-relief. But the human visual system is pretty good at interpreting its probable three-dimensional shape, even though it's actually not fully formed. And the reason for that was explained in a great paper in CVPR uh, called the bas-relief ambiguity. And so what they said was changing the depth of an object is equivalent to changing the angle of the lighting on it for a diffuse object. They produce the same image. And here's a diagram from the paper that actually shows that. So here is um, a cross section through the object. So this sticks out further and this sticks out even further like that. And the light is assumed to come from here. And if you work out the amount of illuminance that will fall on each point on the surface, and it, we, if we assume it's a diffuse surface, it'll uh, uh, reflect equally in all directions. That is going to have exactly the same illuminance as this situation where the heights are half as much and the lighting is at a different, shallower angle. You can just work that out from geometry. And so artists appreciated this. So when you look at a bas-relief, it's easy for you mentally to think of it as a sculpture with a light coming from a different angle. And so we can very naturally interpret bas-reliefs. Otherwise, they might be very hard to interpret. See how that works? You didn't catch me on the shadows? It doesn't quite work because the shadows that are cast here will give away the angle. All right. So recap, um, lighting can be classified by its spatial spread, its angular spread, umbra and penumbra. Here are studio lighting devices. We talked about portrait lighting, key, fill, rim, background, and we talked about lots and lots and lots of special cases. Any burning questions? So we're going to switch, we're going to switch to uh, flash. Florian? You're right. I'm wrong. I thought there was some cue that was in there. Let me think about it. I'll post a sticky on the lecture notes. I thought that there was some cue. Is the bar relief actually more of a so you have to use the lighting of the uh, shallow line that you the bar relief is more of a perceived way of being uh, right. That's what. Uh, so bar relief is defined as uh, something that is a bar relief. Literally means low relief. Sorry, I should have defined that. Uh, Florian, I think you might be right, and I might be wrong. But it was something that isn't the same as if it were a deeper sculpture. Let me think about it offline. I will post a sticky on the lecture notes once I've thought that through. You write that down. 
All right. So let's switch to when to use Flash. Anything on the Dory? No. Okay. All right. So um, the obvious use of Flash is freezing the action. And then we'll talk about fill Flash, Flash plus ambient, a lot of different uses of Flash, ways to avoid using Flash. And then we'll talk about Flash technologies. So I've shown you this amazing picture before. They're not hung up with strings. It's, they actually jumped into the air like that. Here's a couple more Lois Greenfield uh, pictures. These are taken with Flash in order to freeze the action, the strobe. Uh, this one uh, didn't need a strobe, but it's just such a cute picture. I just had to include it. <laughs> I don't know how they get the baby to make that facial expression. All right, fill Flash. So this is a common time when you would like to use Flash. Uh, if you were to expose for the foreground in this scene, you'll get them nicely. If you expose for the background, you'll get the columns. You can't get both of them at once. So what you do is you expose for the background and then add a Flash. It's a very typical scenario. Um, you could potentially use high dynamic range imaging that requires multiple shots. And there's only a certain ratio that you could use to boost the what would otherwise be uh, underexposed. Um, here's a success case for that, um, where uh, she and the dog and the rocks are a little bit too dark, but the, the background is nicely exposed. And here's the dynamic range, high dynamic range shot. This is on the Nexus 5 with our uh, my team software, HDR+. Plus. All right, so here's another situation. So we'll talk about the high dynamic range tone mapping um, in a later lecture, we talk uh, next week when we talk about post-processing. OK, so flash plus ambient. So if you just take a flash picture and most things are far away, they will be dark because flash falls off as the square of the distance. And so a way to bring, to, to place the objects in context is to have some ambient light. You can take a longer exposure. Of course, the problem with the longer exposure is that then some objects are going to be blurred. But now there's at least some context. So it avoids isolating the foreground from the background. Here's another use of a flash. You can use a flash as a fill light even if you don't change the exposure. So in this case, the key light or the, well, yeah, I guess you would call, I don't know what you'd call the key light. I guess the flash is the key light. But anyway, the, the brightest light here, the available light was the sun. It was golden hour, but it only illuminated part of her face. And so I added a flash in order to fill in the rest. I did not change the exposure. So in this case, I'm just adding light. So even if the exposures are reasonable, you can change the balance between key and fill by using a flash. So you have to be very careful in a portrait like this because the light is so strongly colored. So golden hour is golden. The flash has a very high color temperature. We talked about color temperatures. It's D6500, so 6500 Kelvin black body. And so it's kind of bluish white. And it would look bluish white and horrible on her. So what I had to do, uh, it was this uh, flash. And I had to put this little Velcro on it. And then take out an orange filter. You can see that it's orange. And then attach it like that. And so now I was roughly matching the color temperature of the golden sunset with my flash. and so. Um, a flash photographer will always carry a whole packet of these kinds of filters with them. Uh, right. So that, that's what I just said. You don't need uh, flash just to brighten the scene, but it's still useful for changing the, the balance or the color. All right, here's another quiz. How is this professional portrait lit? This is not easy, but we've shown you kind of enough examples. How do you think this is lit? Someone yell, yell out some lights. It's probably more than one. There's a cool background light. Gel. Cool background light. You mean the light on the wall here? Mm -hmm. OK. Gel with something cool, some bluish tone. Some bluish tone. OK, what else? Sorry? Uh, no, it's an indoor shot in my laboratory at Stanford. 
That's the Sanford multi-camera array. Warm light from, like coming from here? Right, so it seems to be coming from the right side as you're looking at the, uh, the picture. Is there a fill light on that? Is there anything coming from the left? On the shirt? Yeah, so there are three lights here. This is a very complicated lighting situation. Uh, she, uh, Linda used a light with an orange filter on it coming from the right side. That's the key light. And then she had a second flash without um, a gel on it. So it's kind of whitish coming from the left side and further away so that it would be a, a, a fill light. She fired them both with radios. So pocket wizards. You were involved in that, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, and then she has a light on the back background. And it's very blue. She's got a blue gel in front of it. So I asked her, well, why, why blue? And she kind of looked at me like I was from Mars. And she said, well, the color of science is blue, right? Uh, why is the color of science blue? Well, it kind of, in the popular imagination, maybe because of the atomic age, uh, Cherenkov radiation, yeah, it probably is blue. There's, there's more going on here. This is a very carefully thought through shot. Look at the way the camera is dutched. So you know what dutching a camera means? She took the camera and while she was taking these, these portraits of me, she went like this. <laughs> dutching the camera means rolling it. It comes from Deutsch, which comes from the expressionist movies of the 20s and 30s in Germany. And uh, the movie that we perhaps know the best um, that has that same feeling is Citizen Kane. Look at the way the camera is dutched in Citizen Kane, rolled. So it's very disconcerting to have someone doing like an interview of you and the cameraman's going around the whole time, you know, just going like this. Like, hello, am I not standing up straight or something? But the, this, is, this is a style. So it's kind of interesting to think through, even in just a simple lab shot like this, how much cultural baggage there is that comes through in things like the choice of lighting and the choice of camera angles. It's very culturally laden. How is this shot lit? This is much closer to a candid shot, but done by a very good photographer who even in just 20 seconds knew exactly what, how, to, how to make a nice shot. This was done at a ski lodge up in the Sierras. Andrew Adams wrote some of the um, applets, that you've, the flash applets that you've been using in the course. So to flash with an orange gel pointed backwards at the wall. So let's pretend I was Andrew Adams at the wall. Uh, sorry, no, the wall behind the photographer. Sorry, the wall behind the photographer. So I'm the photographer, you're Andrew Adams. In order to light that up as an indiffuse, as a indirect lighting, but with an orange gel on it. And then he set up a little desk lamp, which was white to make a little differently colored rim light. And he did that just like in 20 seconds. I watched him do it. And he was done with the shot and kind of moved on and sipped his beer. But if you're a really good photographer, you can do these kinds of things very fast. You think through exactly what would make the right portrait in a case like this. Again, controlled with uh, the pocket wizard. Uh, voiding flash. So. Uh, in many situations, you can avoid flash. Here's a, here's a great case where a gradient filter, which you can buy, can do that. So by putting on a gradient filter that's more opaque at the top and less opaque at the bottom, you can frequently um, photograph a sunset. Again, with high dynamic range photography, that might not be as necessary as it once was. So instead of taking this single shot, I could take this with HDR plus mode. But if you happen to have a gradient filter, you don't need to take multiple shots. You can get more dynamic range into a single picture. So where you place flash is, as you could well expect, very important. Uh, if you place it directly on the camera, you will get almost no shadow. You'll probably get red eye as well. And it's not a very pleasing lighting. And so off-camera flash is definitely preferred. So off-camera flash, 
you have a cord like this. And it's, there are lots of websites. Here's, a, uh, oh, sorry. So look, just look at the nose and you can see all the difference between the, uh, the different flash directions. There's a great website, um, it's a great website called strobus.com that talks about off-camera flash. And the entire website is just devoted to teaching you about off-camera flash. But it's actually a great tutorial on flash in general. Um, so look, look at this. So you can take uh, this flash and you can turn it up and fire it at the ceiling. And the ceiling, well, this one's green, but aside from that, it makes a great indirect light source. Or if you don't have something like that, you can take an umbrella. And so I happen to have a white umbrella here or a reflective umbrella, depending on what kind of light you want. And so these, this is standard photographic lighting. Extra tools and you can fire the flash uh, into the umbrella and it will make a diffuse, I'm going to fire this flash, make a diffuse large light source. All right, let's talk a little bit about flash technology. So I'm not going to uh, do a flash powder demonstration here <laughs> in the room. That sounds like a bad idea. Uh, flash bulbs, uh, flash cubes. So uh, I actually remember these from my childhood on the Instamatic cameras. Um, nowadays, flash is just electronic. And the way an electronic flash works is it's a capacitor. And by the way, if you take apart a camera, be very careful of the flash capacitor that's inside it. It's got, uh, it'll deliver a very nasty jolt if you haven't discharged it, first with a screwdriver. I have experience of that. I have experience of it too, yes, yeah. Uh, even, uh, yeah, yeah, so be very careful. Um, it, it can kill you. It can kill you. <laughs> but fluorine is still here, so it must have killed a friend. <laughs> um, on a big flash, that, all right, that's really scary. I didn't know that. Um, so it's a high voltage ionization of the gas inside the tube, which uh, essentially then um, causes lightning to go back along the ionized air. And so if you look at this closely, here's a little gratuitous animation. That's the streamer and then the, when it turned white, that was the actual flash. Let me show that again. Oh, you, it's cycling. So those are the, the pre-streamers, the lightning leaders. And then the, the return stroke in the case of lightning is the, the big flash when the whole thing just turns white. All right, so how do you control this flash? So it's discharge uh, in a xenon tube. The luminous intensity of a xenon flash is fixed. So that you cannot control. So remember, luminous intensity is lumens per steradian, meaning lumens per solid angle. You cannot change that. The flash is briefer than the shutter, so you cannot use the shutter speed to control it. It's a very quick flash. Uh, you can still use the shutter speed relative to the flash to control the balance between flash illumination and ambient illumination, but you can't use it to control the power of the flash. The aperture, of course, will control that, but it will also control the ambient light, and the same thing with the ISO. The only variable that you have, aside from the placement of the flash, is the duration. And so here are some plots over time. I think these are in milliseconds. I'm not sure of that. Uh, and this is the 430EX, which is a smaller cousin of this guy here, uh, at low power where it drops quickly and at higher power where it extends longer. It's funny, if I look at the integral under this, it doesn't look like it's that much longer. But that's, this is off of uh, manufacturer's data and this is what they claim. So just by controlling the duration of it, you can, uh, you can um, control the amount of power. So the power of a flash is indicated by something called guide numbers. And so uh, the flash, um, wait, I'll get to that in just a second. So the correct F number for you to use is the published guide number for that flash divided by the distance to the subject. So they define it in terms of the distance. And of course, that varies with focal length for a zooming flash. So you think to yourself, well, what's a zooming flash? So if I take this uh, 
Canon 5D Mark III and this flash and put it on there and turn them both on. So do you see, I'm zooming, this is a zoom lens, it's 24 to 105, you see the way the flash is zooming too? Can you see that? There's actually some optics that are going back and forth in there. So you can actually see that the flash itself is zooming. And so it's changing its field of view to match the field of view roughly of the, of the camera itself. And if you don't do that properly, then although a wide angle lens and a wide angle flash might look like this, a wide angle lens with a narrow angle flash will only illuminate the center. All right, so here's some examples. So this monster here has a guide number 58. Um, a Panasonic, uh, th that's a micro for the four thirds camera. I showed you some of those earlier in the course. That might have a guide number of something like 19. A little point and shoot camera might have a guide number of four. Uh, I meant to include a guide number for our cell phone cameras like the Nexus 6P. I will look that up and add that to the lecture notes. Guide number for a cell phone. Might not be published that way. This might actually be a hard assignment for me to try and come up with a guide number for a, a cell phone. Well, it also might make a whole lot of sense if you can't change the lens that way with the cell phone. Meaning, it, meaning there's nothing you can do if you had that knowledge. Right. It would just be interesting to see what the relative flash power is relative to these. Right. But there isn't anything you can do about it. Um, it's worth noting also that the 580X is defined at its monitor Okay. Right. Oh, it's long. Oh, wait, as long as it's most zoomed in focal length. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to write that game as a sticky uh, game of zooms um, for guide number. Thank you. That's interesting. Oh, and sometimes it's given in detail resolution. Which is just <laughs> uh, well, okay. That's that's a less of a game. Me feet instead of meters. Okay. So let's try to use these guide numbers. Let's, let's do a little um, example. So for the Canon uh, 580EX and a subject that's 10 feet away, then you would say 58 divided by 10 is 5.8. So it tells you you ought to use F5.6 being the closest F stop. So that's how you use a guide number. Now suppose that you had a faster lens. Instead of an F6 lens, suppose you had an F 1.4 lens, how far away can the subject be? So this is the kind of calculation that uh, as a photographer you ought to be able to just do quickly in your head. Let's see. So 5.6 over 1.4. So you could think about that just as 5.6 over 1.4 equals 4x, or if you wanted to, you could go ahead and say, well, let's see, 5.6, 4.0, 2.8, just remember all the f stops, 2.0, 1.4, 1.2, four stops, four doublings. Sorry, four doublings. So that's um, 16 x the amount of light because each doubling is one or each f stop is one doubling so that's two to the fourth so that's um 16 times as much light now let's see if we treat the flash as a point light source and uh it's got 16 times as much light then light falls off as the square of the distance so we ought to be able to stand um uh, f uh, four times as far away, right? So instead of 10 feet, the subject could be 40 feet away. So you see how that calculation works? 16 times as much light allows four times the distance. Okay, metering. So this is proprietary to each camera manufacturer and very uh, and so kind of difficult to ferret out. But here's kind of a typical sequence of what happens. Uh, on shutter half press, focus under ambient light, or maybe there's an auto, of, uh, auto assist light. I think this one probably has one, a little light that'll come on just to help it uh, focus. 
And then it'll also meter under the ambient light, kind of get some idea of how much light is out there. On the shutter press, it'll fire a pre-flash to decide how much light is being reflected from the close by objects so that it doesn't saturate them. Decide on the flash power uh, as well as the rest of these things. Flip up the mirror, open the shutter, and fire the main flash. So when I take a flash picture with this, I'm actually taking, I'm actually firing it twice. And I'm going to demonstrate that. So I am going to flash again. Let's see. So I'm set in manual mode at a 15th of a second. So you ought to see two flashes. Ready? You see the two flashes? If you didn't, or maybe if there's some aliasing with the television, uh, let me set it down to an eighth of a second, and then I'm sure that you'll be able to see the two flashes. Okay. The problem with this is that the two flashes sometimes cause uh, pupils to dilate or people to look away. Um, so it's a trade-off in the usability of a flash. Uh, I cheated a little bit when I showed you this demo. I used what's called second curtain sync, which means that I delayed the flash until the very end of the time when the shutter was open. Second curtain means when that second curtain of the focal plane shutter comes down. And uh, there's a good reason why you might want to do that. All right, so I already talked about being fooled, and the delay between the pre-flash and the flash is long enough to cause some people to blink, especially if using second curtain sync. So why might you use second curtain sync? Suppose you want to take a shot like this. So the shutter's open. There's some ambient light. Uh, he tosses the card. You see the blur of the card, and then he wants to show the card itself. But he doesn't want to show the card itself at the beginning of its flight. He wants to show it at the end. He wants the motion blur to be behind the card. So in order to do that, you've got to fire the flash at the very end, just before you close the shutter. That's called second curtain sync. And so that's an option on these flashes. And that's how this was captured. A little sidebar here. So when we were um, building the Stanford Franken camera, whose API was the forerunner of the Camera 2 API uh, here at Google, uh, we took an already ugly uh, homemade camera and made it uglier by gluing two flashes to the top of it with uh, hot melt glue. And we took the smaller one and strobed it continuously and took the larger one, which was this one, and fired it once at the end of the exposure. In other words, second curtain sink, effectively. And got this nice picture. So it's sort of the same kind of picture, except that uh, those are discrete rather than continuous because we were using the 430 as a strobe. So there are all kinds of fun games that you can play with um, flash. All right, so the color temperature of flash is important, uh, as I already said, with the color filter. And it is a broad spectrum. It approximates daylight. There's the 6500 Kelvin, also called D65. If you're mixing it with ambient light of another temperature, you've got to do something about it, uh, as I already showed with the portrait of the, the young woman. A typical case where that happens is indoors. If you were to set the white balance uh, to tungsten, the flash will look very blue. So if I had not put the orange filter on when the, uh, in the golden sunset, it would have looked like a blue flash. But the opposite mistake is also bad. If you set the white balance to flash, in other words, you set the white balance to D6500, then the room lights will look extremely orange, which is what happened here. So the part that was flashed looks fairly neutral. His, his vest looks white. But the background looks too orange. I would and argue that that's the photographer's intent in this. Case. <laughs> the photographer's intent? OK, I won't argue with that. Uh, but you can compensate for it with a color correction on the flash. They're enumerated uh, sometimes in degrees of Kelvin of correction. Uh, this one actually says uh, 1 half CTO instead of saying number of degrees of Kelvin. What CTO means color temperature orange. So that's not very helpful. But it's halfway toward some color temperature orange. Sometimes they're enumerated in degrees Kelvin. 
All right, I'm not going to go through all these. There are lots of other features that are on Flash. You can do compensation of various kinds. You can do bracketing. There's strobe modes. I've already talked about the wireless. There are lots and lots of articles you can find on Flash. So let me summarize on Flash. There are lots of problems with it. The, the, the power falls as the distance, so you lose your background. Uh, if the in camera, if the in camera, if you have an in camera flash and it's too close to the lens or the lens is too big, uh, you can get all kinds of nasty effects. Let's see. That's an in camera flash, so it's too close to the lens. And if it's really close to the lens or the lens is big, you can actually get the shadow of the lens on the shot. That's what this is. It's the shadow of the the lens by an in camera flash that's too close and is hitting hitting the the lens. Um, red eye. So I went through all of my pictures and looked for the worst example of red eye I could possibly find from a, a, a flash that's very close to the camera. The pre-flash helps a little bit because it does shrink your pupils. And it helps with the red eye, but it looks a little bit unnatural. Uh, another thing you have to think about is shutter sync speed. So um, in a focal plane shutter, remember how that works. It goes like this. And then it goes like this. So now it's open. You have to fire when it's open. For very high shutter speeds, it only opens a slit and then moves that slit across. So when do you fire the flash there? You can't. There's no time to fire it. So the shortest shutter time at which uh, it's fully open is called the minimum uh, or the maximum speed, the, the shutter sync speed. It's typically 250th of a second. So uh, I should update this slide because now there's something um, called high speed sync, which apparently what they do is th uh, they'll allow you to do, say, a thousandth of a second. So the focal plane shutter is only open to a slit. And then they'll fire multiple strobes as you move it across. That seems almost like magic to me because it, the timing has to be so precise with the motion of that slit. But it apparently does allow it. Do you know something about that? Wait, if you're going to uh, give us a little mini lecture, why don't I give you a mic? There you go. Sure. If you're thinking about the standard flash profile, it decays rapidly. Mm -hmm. Instead, if you think of Bart Simpson's head, that's kind of what HSS looks like. High speed sync is basically still putting out quite a bit of light, but it's being turned on and off. When it's turned off, it's not off long enough for it to fully extinguish. So it's still producing light. Then they turn it back on again, so the ionization is still there. The current ramps up again. You see a spike again, then you turn it off. And this is done with an optical sensor inside the flash body itself and a, uh, an IGBT, which is a transistor that can... So you're saying that the, uh, the ratio is not infinite between the, the two states, but still the synchronization has to be pretty darn close, or otherwise you'll get stripes in your image. You can get stripes at the highest shutter speeds. Ah, uh, okay, okay. But typically, it's just below the threshold of, of objectionability. Objectionability. All right, thank you for that. I will add a sticky to my slide. That's great. Well, Sorry. It's also very inefficient to remove most of the light because it's just the You lose, uh, Florian said you lose most of the light because it just hits the shutter. Great. Um, okay, so. Don't shoot perpendicularly into glass. So, of course, my preference on uh, flash for just adding illumination to a scene is don't. Take multiple exposures and average them together, which is the other half of what HDR Plus does. So that instead of getting a single shot like this, there's a blow up. She's very noisy. Um, you get a shot like that, which is a whole lot better. And this is an old, this is an old, phone, the Nexus 5, but arguably easily beats the iPhone 5S when, when I did this comparison. Okay, so be used to fully freeze the action. Talked about several uses for flash. Um, off camera, bounce flash, we looked at that. Uh, we uh, talked about um, adjusting, uh, the fact that it adjusts the pulse duration, and then we talked about guide numbers. Are there any questions? Okay, let me add just one more tiny little sidebar, and that's that computational photography has quite an interesting promise here. So there have been a number of um, papers on flash, no flash photography. The idea of shooting a flash, 
uh, sorry, uh, shooting an ambient shot and then a shot with flash. And there are good aspects to both of those photographs. The question is, can you produce that result? And it's tricky. Uh, so this particular paper talks about ambient plus flash minus those features in the sum of those two that don't appear in the ambient alone, uh, meaning that reflection. That doesn't appear in the ambient at all, so you want to remove that reflection. And it's done by detecting the gradients of the image. There are going to be gradients here that don't appear here in the same places because it is just the reflection, so you want to remove those. And it's remarkable that it does as good a job as it does. But I can tell you that the, this is brittle. This whole idea of flash, no flash. These papers appeared in the mid-2000s, and uh, I think there's only one cell phone that has tried to do it. Uh, it really is not commercialized yet. And the reason is because there's all kinds of nasty stuff that creeps into it. There are shadows. There are specular highlights. It's difficult to remove those robustly. There could be scene motion as well, and that will confound your attempt to remove those kinds of artifacts. It's very, very difficult to do flash, no flash. So another thing you can imagine doing is just trying to use, so this is a fairly extreme example when you didn't even see her unless uh, you had a flash, where you just use the flash picture to get um, color, which you then apply to the no flash picture, which may not have as much color, or you use one to denoise the other. There's been a lot of people thinking about this. None of them have ever been successfully commercialized. And so I think I'll stop there. We actually have someone coming into the room at noon, so we have to be out a little bit early today. All right. So next week, there'll just be one lecture, and then the following week, there'll just be one lecture as well.